You're listening to Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Bob Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Our guest is Andrew Collins, and we'll be discussing his latest book, The Cygnus Key, published by Bear & Company. Andrew Collins has been investigating the idea of advanced civilizations in prehistory since 1979. He is the co-discoverer of a massive cave complex beneath the Giza Plateau, now known as Collins Caves. The author of several books, including From Ashes of the Angels and the Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, he lives in Essex, England, www.com. Andrew Collins dot com. Welcome back to Twenty First Century Radio, Andrew. Dr. Bob, hi, how are you? I'm about a B plus. Hopefully we'll Good, get... good. Uh, it's, a, it's it's a very hot, muggy night in, in England at the moment. So. What's the what's the temperature there? Um I don't know. It's probably up in the the eighties still. Um it's, we've had probably the hottest um summer on record, I think. It seems like that at least. Uh, and, when, and no sign of any rain coming soon. Well, geez, oh whiz. It's a good thing there's no such thing as global warming, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so pathetic. Well, okay. Just who were the Denisovans? Did I get that pronunciation correctly? Yeah, that's good. Okay, I got that's a good. B plus on that one then. Just who okay, were the well, Denisovans? I mean, this is, a big, this is a big story here because, I mean, we have the Great Pyramid in Egypt, you know, we have Stonehenge in England. We have this incredible place, Gobekli Tepe in southeast Turkey, with these these beautiful stone temples that go back 11,500 years and have changed all that we know about, you know, the origins of civilization. But where did civilization actually come from? And, I mean, there are two ancient mystery alternative theories out there. One is that it was constructed by the the survivors of Atlantis, you know, this, this lost continent that existed out in the, the Atlantic somewhere and sank after some big cataclysm. And survivors went to the west into Mexico and an American general and others went into the east and started civilization there. Um, that's one theory. Another theory is that, that, you know, either directly or indirectly, aliens were involved. I mean, I kid you not, obviously. I mean, I take part in a show called Ancient Aliens. Uh, and, you know, these subjects are being looked at really seriously these days. You know, those are two of the, the, the alternative theories about the origins of civilization. But today we have a third alternative here. And that is the fact that civilization may have been gifted to the earliest modern humans by an advanced human society that existed even before we essentially left Africa, uh, you know, and wandered through Asia and through Europe, um, and obviously eventually end up in, in America as well, and that these people were known as the Denisovans. Now, we didn't even know they existed until 2010, when some, um, some bones and teeth found in a cave at a place called the Altai Mountains in um, Siberia, southern Siberia, were analysed, DNA tested, and it was found that they weren't Neanderthal, they weren't modern human, they weren't anything that we knew, that they were completely new human species. And because the cave itself where they were found was known as the, the, the Denisova Cave, or the Denisova Cave, these people became known as the Denisovans. Um, and although that's the only confirmed bones that we've, we've got that relate to them, and by the way, they would seem to have died out around 40,000 years ago, what we do have is because we've, we have the DNA test and the so-called genome now, what we can say is that we can see the genes of the Denisovans in many different modern human populations, most of them in uh, East Asia, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, Melanesia, and in both North and South America, there are lots of modern populations, indigenous peoples, with Denisovan DNA. And they also inherited various of the genes from the Denisovans. Um, But on top of this, we can look at where the 
obviously the descendants of these Denisovans, these hybrids, if you like, these Denisovan human hybrids reached. Look at mythologies, look at the civilizations, and look for patterns. And this can tell us the influence and the extent of the influence of the Denisovans, even after they disappear from the pages of history. In other words, their legacy lives on within modern human populations. Uh, and you can trace them. And you can trace patterns. You can trace patterns. And on top of this, we know that the Denisovans were incredibly advanced. They produced something known as the Denisovan bracelet. And I mean, for the listeners, just look that up now. Denisovan bracelet. And it's this incredible greenstone piece of jewellery that would have been worn on the arm of a woman, like a bangle, made of this beautiful stone known as clariterite, a form of chloride. And not only does it show uh, advanced um, soaring uh, and polishing techniques, but it also has a, a hole penetrated through it um, that was done by a drill. And the feed rate of this drill is so fast that it's comparable to a modern-day drill. Mm. Now, this piece of jewellery is 60 to 70,000 years old. This changes everything, absolutely everything, because... What it tells us is that as far back as 60 to 70,000 years ago, this is before even our own modern human ancestors reached this region, that there were people alive, the Denisovans, who had incredible technology. But on top of this, they also would seem to have worn tailored clothing um, because they, they produced bone needles, which were clearly used for this purpose. They had incredibly advanced stone tool technologies of a type that goes on to exist all the way through to the Neolithic Age, about 10,000 years ago. Uh, and as well as this, there's even evidence that they produced the earliest musical instruments. In other words, they had knowledge of sound and possibly even sound acoustics, and that they may well have domesticated and ridden horses. And just to throw in on top of all that is that all of the fossil remains found so far of the Denisovans are of, 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 of extreme size, which tells us that these, these guys were very large and also very tall. They may be seven, seven and a half feet tall. Um, so, you know, this is all new. This has all come out just in the past few years. Uh, and this is, what I, this is the story I try and portray in this book. And I trace the legacy of their technology all the way across the world, including eventually into Egypt. And I believe that the, the greatest um, achievement of the Denisovan hybrids was the creation of the, of the Pyramid Age in Egypt and the construction of the Great Pyramid with all of its mathematics uh, and geometry and, and, and knowledge that we know is contained within that. That's the final great legacy, I think, of the descendants of the Denisovans. Why would be the Denisovans be so important to us here in America? Well, because they, they well, we, we don't know specifically whether the, the Denisovans were in America yet. We think that they were, but what we do know is that the Denisovan human hybrids reached America North America and South America, possibly as early as, as 30 to 40,000 years ago, um, and that they obviously settled and that the descendants of these people um, formed various different uh, tribal uh, groups, first peoples um, that exist, not only in North America, for instance, many of the Algonquin-speaking uh, peoples, including the Ojibwa um, and the Cree, have quite a considerable level of Denisovan DNA. Um, there are various um, indigenous peoples in, for instance, the Amazon that have got Denisovan DNA, but also in Peru, uh, in the Andes, um, and also in Central America as well, places like Costa Rica. Um, so we know that the, dis the, the, the descendants of the Denisovans reached America. Plus, on top of this, we know that that skeletal remains have been found in a large number of um, Native American mounds um, in many different states that have been found to contain extremely large skeletons. 
um, possibly seven to seven and a half feet tall. Um, and when these skeletons are found, they're generally in a position within the mound that shows that they are high status. These were very, very important. Almost certainly they were the leaders, the elite of the mound building cultures, um, in, as probably shamans as well. And it would seem as if they formed the elite group uh, behind the um, uh, various different cultures, particularly the Adena culture during the, the first millennia BC, where the skeletal remains crop up. And in 2014, I proposed that the, 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 the giants of America, these ancient giants, were almost certainly Denisovan hybrids. Uh, and, I, and I stick with that today. We're still after the final DNA evidence that will confirm that. But I will, you know, that I will stick my neck out and say that we will find that they that they are of Denisovan descendancy. I was just amazed at the size of their teeth. We don't have many of their teeth, but we have a few, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, so far three teeth have been found, and all of them are oversized. I mean, two of them are so large that they were almost dismissed as as teeth of cave bears when they were first discovered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and as I said, let's, let's focus on the area here, because we're talking about southern Siberia, the Altai Mountains, um, which is in the same area as Mongolia. Um, and what I look at is that, that a lot of the earliest inventions and ideas um, in everything from religion um, to stone tool technologies, um, and as I said, musical instruments, all are generated from this very area of the sun, this, this very area where we know the Denisovans were. And I think this is a product of our earliest modern human ancestors reaching Siberia, making a connection with the Denisovans, obviously interbreeding with them. We don't know how this came about. We don't know whether it was, you know, one, one group fancy in the other or, or what. I mean, or whether it was... Um, a little bit more, you know, um, uh, violent, but um, something happened, and this would seem to have happened in more than one locality. In other words, the interbreeding between Denisovans and our own ancestors took place probably uh, in several different regions. Um, but what's interesting is that the Denisovans only seem to be in Central and Eastern Asia, they do not seem to have existed in their own right in Europe or in Southwest Asia. Uh, this seems to have been the territory of the Neanderthals. Now, the Neanderthals um, existed at the same time. There's relationship between the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, but the Denisovans would seem to have had a much, you know, a much um, more advanced mindset than the, the, than the Neanderthals. Uh, what's so interesting is that the, the Denisovan genome shows that the Denisovans had autistic genes, um, very specific ones that have been identified within modern humans. Uh, and what I propose is that one of the reasons why they advanced so quickly, oh, evolved yes. to the level of producing like this incredible jewellery, that you know the Denisovan bracelet, is that they were switched on and had these savant-like qualities, uh, which, which, to be honest, we, we strive to understand today, um, you know, from a medical point of view, and that their brains may have been switched on in a way that our, that our own modern human brains were not switched on at the same time. Plus, what's also important is that the Denisovans have been around a lot longer than, than, than we did. The earliest hu modern human ancestors only goes back to about 300,000 years ago. However, the Denisovans would seem to have come into their own about 800,000 years. So that's an awful lot longer period of time for them to develop you know, their own physiology, their own mindset, their own material culture. I think that all of these combined to show that very lightly some of the rudiments of civilization actually were given to us by the Denisovans. we got to take our first break here on 21st Century Radio, Andrew. And, and when we come back, could you tell us more about the autistic background to the Denisovans? 
Certainly. Okay. We'll be back in just 21st Century Radio, uh, well, a few minutes, to sing this key, the Nisivan Legacy, Gobekli Tepe, the birth of Egypt, Bear and Company, AndrewCollins.com. Hi, I'm Michael A. Cremo. I'm author of the book Forbidden Archaeology, and I'm very happy to be on 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. It is a fascinating show, intellectually groundbreaking, presenting alternative points of view on all areas of science and popular culture. Uh, you were giving us some of their autistic background, but could we get a little bit deeper into that background of the Denisovans? Yes, it's, 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 it's a fact that, um, that autism, um, those on the autistic spectrum, that certain genes have been identified um, as being associated with it. Now, normally those genes um, are dormant, but it would seem as if they are responsible for triggering um, certain autistic talents within people, whether it be at birth or whether it be through trauma. Uh, I mean, because, I mean, autistic, it, autism is something which uh, is there either at birth or it can be something that can come on you know, maybe through a car accident or, or some kind of near-death experience, you know, somebody even being beaten up or something like that, something will trigger the brain to start rewiring. Um, and the, the genes associated with this, you know, can be identified. Well, they've been found in the Denisovans themselves. And this is not to say necessarily that every Denisovan was, all, you know, was autistic, but it may well be that these genes function in a slightly different way. In other words, that they operated to give the Denisovans a certain type of mindset which is difficult for us to understand. You know, in other words, they may have seen things important which today we strive to understand, like, for instance, cal calendar calculating uh, with autistic people. I mean, obviously, we know, that we know about this. We know that, that an autistic person can tell you, you know, or one of the abilities, one of the savant qualities um, is them to tell what day of the week um, you know, in any particular year in the past or, or the present. Um, and they have this idea, this, this, this ability to, to, to remember this type of incredible inf information. Well, something else that we find occurring for the first time in the very area where the Denisovans were in southern Siberia in the Altai Mountains is the beginning of the use of very complex, what we call cosmic numbers, um, which we find eventually going into mythologies, sacred literature, sacred architecture around the world in places like Cambodia and Java and India, um, of certain key numbers like 54, 108, 216, 432, uh, and, and, and numbers that are generated by, by these, these particular numbers. Now, this is something which you know, various of my colleagues like Graham Hancock um, have pointed out in their books and said, you know, w w where do these numbers come from? They must have some kind of, of you know, universal uh, source, um, a place of origin, um, you know, whether it be Atlantis or, or something like that. Well, the fact is that at a place that is quite close to the Altai Mountains, um, uh, a site called Malta, M-A-L apostrophe T-A, which is on a branch of a big river there called the Angara River, which flows um, into um, uh, the, um, uh, the Lake Bacow, flows out of, I should say, Lake Bacow, this massive inland sea, is that there was a, um, a settlement there that goes back 24,000 years. And um, they found various incredible advanced uh, items there, including some beautiful mother goddesses, these incredible swamp pendants, which archaeologists... Um, uh, say relates to the idea of the bird uh, being the symbol of the soul uh, and early forms of shamanism and stuff like this. But amongst the other artifacts they found are these objects which seem to relate to counting. Um, one in particular, which we call the multiplite, as a series of spirals, uh, seven main spirals on one side, and on the other side it's got these three uh, snakes. And they're, all, they're, they're, they're packed in which means that they have a certain amount of numbers. And the number sequences are very clearly 
based on cyclic time, uh, not just to do with the sun and the moon, but long-term eclipse cycles, what's known as the triple Saros cycle, which is 54 years. Um, and the, the combination between this 54-year triple Saros cycle um, and the idea that the stars process or move um, through something known as precession, um, one degree every 72 years, um, the combination of this with the Saros cycle seems to generate these numbers, 432, 216, and whatever. Uh, in other words, it would seem as if at least 24,000 years ago, they had a cyclic calendar that was generating these numbers, and the oldest form of this calendar existing today can still be found in this very same area of, of the Alte Mountains. Now, if it goes back at least to 24,000 years, in the, and it's in the very same area that the Dissevans were, is it possible that the descendants of the hybrid were the people that passed on this knowledge to these early modern human communities? And is it possible that the Denisovans, with their, their you know, autistic mindset, were the people that generated these incredible calendar systems in the first place? In other words, they were doing what modern autistic people do with their calendar counting, but they were projecting forward and using the celestial objects to, to quite literally calendar count. Uh, and I think that this is exactly what was going on, um, and that this is the source of these numbers. And these numbers, by the way, are found, you know, in everything from Angkor Wat uh, in Cambodia, you know, within the, the measurement of the architecture, uh, Moro Buddha, uh, the incredible Buddhist complex in Java. Um, you find them in Indian um, cyclical time, uh, you know, within the, the Vedic tradition. Um, you know, to do with the days and nights of Brahma, you know, these hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, all of them are broken down um, by this amount, 432. You find it in Chinese um, psychical time. You find it in Norse mythology. Uh, and as I show in the book, it's there in Egypt as well. Um, the Great Pyramid is associated with these very same numbers. Um, and, you know, you might say, well, hold on, you know, the Great Pyramid was built probably around 2,600 B.C. How can it possibly be related to the Denisovans? But what I show is that the legacy of the Denisovans moves like a wave southwards into India, eastwards into China and Japan and Korea, um, and also southeastwards into places like Indonesia, but also, it's filtering through into Europe and Southwest Asia as well, um, and influences the, the design and construction of places like Gobekli Tepe in Southeast Turkey 11,500 years ago, and that people from Gobekli Tepe continue the journey south through the Levant, you know, what is today uh, Syria and Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, um, and down into North Africa, the Nile Valley, and what is today Egypt, and that this knowledge remains there and flowers again at the beginning of dynastic history, which obviously culminates, of course, with the construction of the Great Pyramid, with all of the incredible knowledge of mathematics and geometry that, that we know is within this. And I think this knowledge comes originally from the Denisovans. Well, you noted a little bit about their size, but could you tell us a little bit more about what they look like, and, and, and are they the giants of legend? Yes, um, I, I think they probably are. I mean, you know, we, we all know the, 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 the fishing, the angling story, that, you know, somebody catches a fish and afterwards somebody says, you know, well, what size was it? And their, 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 their hands gradually widen more and more and more. And I think that, it's the same thing with the Denisovans. Um, I think that they were big guys. I, I really do. Um, I think that they were probably, and I'm not saying they all were, but I, I, I would say that amongst them were what we would call, you know, quite literally giants, probably seven to seven and a half feet tall. Um, whether they were any higher than this, I don't know. But, I mean, certainly the anatomical evidence would suggest that this is the case. Um, but 
if you want to imagine what they look like, just think of the largest wrestlers in the WWE today. Um, there's one, for instance, who was born in India, whose name is the Great Kali. That's K H A L I, the, the, the Great Kali. And have a look at him, because, I mean, he's seven feet tall, built hugely. And when I look at him, other than his chin, which is quite pointed, and I don't think that was anything to do with the Denisovans, I say that this guy is what I would say a Denisovan would look like. And um, I, I don't think you can go far wrong from that assessment of, of the evidence that we've got. And by the way, although there are only a few bones and, and uh, you know, um, teeth and whatever that have been found so far that have been directly linked with the Denisovans, um, there are a number of other um, jaw bones and skulls and, and things like that that have been found that we haven't got absolute DNA evidence that confirms that they're, they're Denisovan, but the anthropologists have, you know, looked at them and said, yeah, we think this is part of the same of, of the same human group. Um, so, you know, the, there is other evidence here, but we're waiting at this time for the confirmation. Is there any possibility that they are connected with the Anunnaki? Yes, they are, yeah. I mean, um, the Anunnaki today are considered by a lot of people to be space aliens, um, that, you know, that, that came down from, from, a, from another star or the planet Nibiru, um, you know, about 200 and 250,000 years ago, they landed in in South Africa. You know, they, they created, you know, humanity to work down mines, to, to mine for gold. And they took the gold and took it off planet and never came back. That's basically the story that you get relating to the Anunnaki. But I'll, I, I, in my opinion, this is a, a very naive way of looking at it. Um, because if you look at the ancient Sumerian text, they talk about the, the Anunnaki. And by the way, the, the term Anunnaki is a late form of that name. The original name was Anuna. Oh, um, they were the Anuna. And the Anuna basically means um, the sky people, basically, or, or, or the gods or people of the sky. Um, and I don't think this necessarily means that they came from the sky. I think it was people, flesh and blood, human beings, with knowledge of the sky. In other words, they knew about the, the origins of, of humanity amongst the, 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 the stars. They knew about the, the death journey that the soul had to make. You know, it, uh, once, it, once um, the, you, know, you died, you went somewhere. And what I show, and the reason why the book's called The Cygnus Key, is because it would seem that right from the age of the Denisovans, all the way through Gebekli Tepe, down into Egypt and the construction of the Great Pyramids, it seemed as if there was one area of the sky that they constantly pointed towards and said, origin. And this was the constellation of Cygnus, uh, which we know as uh, a celestial bird, most often a swan, although at Gebekli Tepe it was a vulture. In Egypt it was a falcon. And that this was seen as a place of origin. Now, Cygnus is more commonly known, uh, certainly in, in, in North, um, North America, as the Northern Cross. It's a very prominent uh, constellation which, uh, in all honesty, if you went out into the sky after this, this program finishes, uh, you'll see this, this, this cross shape of stars almost directly above you, and this is Cygnus, um, or the Northern Cross. And this has been a really important constellation for, you know, tens of thousands of years. I mean, it, it's, it's represented in the caves of southern France. Um, it, you know, there are various monuments, like the, the temples at Quebec Tepe are aligned towards the setting of its stars. So are, so are the, 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 um, the, the pyramids at Giza. Um, they are aligned towards the setting of, of the prominent star Cygnus. Um, and all the way around the world, various... Native American mound build, building cultures all align their stars, sorry, their, their, their mounds, to two groups of stars. One was Cygnus, the other was Orion. Um, the, those two constellations worked in harmony with each other. Uh, the death journey would begin by this leap of faith 
to the Orion constellation, and this is found also in ancient Egypt, as I point out. And from there, the soul would continue its journey along the Milky Way, symbolically at least, um, which was seen as a, um, a road or river to the sky world. And then it would reach a point on the Milky Way where the starry stream broke into two separate branches, forked into two separate branches. Uh, and this was seen as the point of entry into the sky world. Um, and right at that point is where the Cygnus stars are located. So that's one of the reasons why Cygnus was, was very important. There are, there are many other reasons as well, but it would seem as if from a very early time, you know, there was a belief that this area of the sky was important to our cosmic origins, that we came from there before incarnation, and that our souls returned there in death. And this is a universal idea found all over the world. I mean, having said that, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, clearly people would look towards the Southern sky for, for their, their, their cosmic origins. Uh, what about... I was thinking about, oh, oh, we got to take a break, unfortunately. Time out here on the playing field with uh, Andrew Collins, the Cygnus Key, the Nisabin Legacy, Ubekli Tepe, and the Birth of Egypt, Bear and Company is the publisher. Hello, this is Dr. Robert Schock, author of Voices of the Rocks, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus, one of the most fascinating shows on the air. There are some really important things within this book. Uh, Robert Baval says that, well, something to the event that the Orion Belt is key to certain things dealing with the pyramids in Egypt. But you present a very strong case that perhaps, uh, the, why, you, why do you believe that the pyramids of Giza are aligned to Cygnus? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I mean... It's, Obviously, uh, I read the Orion Mystery back in the 1990s, um, and uh, it's a great book, and Robert Bazaar is a good friend of mine. Um, but um, a good friend of mine also is uh, the engineer uh, Rodney Hale, um, and um, he tried to match the stars of, of Orion um, on the three pyramids from overhead, and it, it didn't quite work. Um, you know, he was slightly troubled by that, but, but sort of left it for a few years. Uh, and then in 2004, um, I started to realize the significance of Cygnus um, to the ancient cultures around the world, particularly at Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey. Um, and he started to think about the pyramids again. Uh, and he wondered what would happen if you put the key stars, the three key stars uh, that make the wing. Of the wings of, of the bird of Cygnus um, over the three main pyramids at Giza, and they fitted perfectly. Uh, and he told me about this, and I remember at the time thinking, uh, this is not going to go down well, <laughs> because, um, you know, there are so many supporters of the, of the Orion correlation that um, this is going to put me in big trouble. Um, but, um, you know, I, I published it, and Robert Bouval rightly said, you know, it's context, it's context, it, it's, it's not about how accurate, you know, stars match um, pyramids, but why they would do so in the first place, and he's absolutely correct, but what's so important about the alignment um, at Cyg of Cygnus over the, the, the pyramids, which, by the way, doesn't just work from a point of looking down and the, 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 the geographical positions of the three pyramids match the stars above. But if you then go onto the ground itself and look at the same three pyramids and see those stars setting, they set down one after the other into the respective peaks of the same three pyramids. In other words, the Cygnus alignment, where that's got a, an advantage over Orion, is that it's in three dimensions. It's a three-dimensional reality. In other words, it works both in the horizontal and in the vertical plane. But what's more important is what are the pyramids? What, what do they actually represent? Well, I mean, I do believe that they were originally constructed as tombs, although I think the word tomb is, you know, is, is an oversimplification. I mean, when we think of tomb, we think of, of a, a, a graveyard and, a you know, a coffin in a 
a, a, a tomb there and we go there once a year and put flowers on a tomb or whatever. But that's not what the ancient Egyptians saw in terms of a tomb. You might as well call it an ascension machine because the idea was to quite literally project the soul of the pharaoh into the afterlife, into the star world. Um, and at death, the pharaoh would take the role of the god Osiris. Now, he was not only the god of the dead, but he was the dead god, the god that he's, that he's dead. Uh, and the reason for this is that his whole mythos surrounded the fact that he is killed by his treacherous, um, you know, evil brother, Set. Um, and he's tricked inside this, this coffin, um, which is then you know, nailed up and thrown in the River Nile, and, and, and Osiris dies. And his myth is about the resurrection of, Os of Osiris, uh, particularly through the, the, the aid of his, um, his wife, the goddess Isis. Now, that's, you know, that's that. So in other words, this is the, the character who the pharaoh becomes. But what's significant here is that the mother of Osiris is Nuit. Nuit is the sky goddess, and she's often shown as this naked woman arched over the earth in Egyptian tradition. And she is a representation of the Milky Way in the northern sky. And where the Milky Way splits in two, we already talked about this, this, this place where it forks in two, is the area of her thighs and womb. And the, the body of, 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 of ancient texts known as the, the pyramid texts, which are found in the pyramids that come just after the age of those built at Giza, talk about the pharaoh in his role as Osiris, going back to the womb of his mother, his mother being knew it. In other words, what's happening is that he's going back to the Cygnus constellation, because that is the womb of his mother, knew it. Mm. In other words, once again, we've got the same idea of the soul returning back to this, this same area of the sky. But to reach Cygnus, it goes first to Orion. So Orion is very important in ancient Egypt, um, and in connection with the, the, the pyramids and everything, but it is only the first step of the journey, because from Orion, you continue symbolically along the Milky Way until you reach the Cygnus constellation. And this is where your, you know, your mother embraces you. you know, the, the Osiris goes back to his mother and, and you know, enters into the sky world or the afterlife. So this is the reason why the three pyramids at Giza are aligned to Cygnus. And uh, Robert Bouvard is right. It is all about context. Well, what is the connection between Gobekli Tepe and the Giza pyramids? Well, the, 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 the pyramids and the incredible stone monuments at Gobekli Tepe, which, for those listeners that, that don't know about this, this is a series of these stone temples, which are a, a little bit like Stonehenge, but they're made of these pillars with T-shaped tops. And they're covered in beautiful carvings, and they're in like a, the spokes of a, a wheel within these, these sort of stone enclosures. Um, and they surround these two huge great monoliths in the centre of the temples that also have T-shaped terminations. And these stones, they're covered in carvings of animals and birds. Um, they're anthropomorphic as well in the fact that they've got like these arms sort of carved in relief on their sides that terminate on their front narrow edges in these long spindly fingers, which are, you know, quite spooky and quite strange. Um, and the heads of these anthropomorphic figures, these stone figures, are the T-shaped tops of the stones. Um, they're left blank, they're left abstract, you can't see any faces on them, but they're clearly meant to be human. And these temples are aligned not just through the, the, the twin pillars in the centre of the stone enclosures towards the setting of Deneb, the brightest star in the constellation of Cygnus. And this is something that's been co confirmed by uh, it, uh, uh, two Italian academics that looked into this and confirmed these alignments were correct. 
but you have at Giza exactly the same alignments. In many ways, what the pyramids represent is exactly the same as what the stone temples at Gobekli Tepe represent as well. They are almost shortcuts, stargates, if you like, portals between this world and the next. Um, and that next is the afterlife, the star world, which is seen to be associated with the constellation of Cygnus, the celestial bird or swan or whatever. Could you tell us what the connection between Cygnus and our cosmic origins? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to start saying to yourself, well, I keep hearing this this word Cygnus, and obviously your book is called, you know, the Cygnus Key. So why is it so important? Well, as I've already explained, it's very prominently placed upon the Milky Way where it falls into two. But beyond that is that just before the time of Gebekli Tepe, uh, and we're talking, you know, just a few thousand years, is that the stars of Cygnus occupied the very centre point of the heavens because today we have the pole star Polaris that marks the turning point of the heavens in the northern sky. But this star, or the position of, of, of this turning point, changes. It's known as the northern celestial pole. Uh, it's on a cycle, uh, a circle of about 26,000 years. And for a period of about four or 5,000 years, um, you know, every cycle, the northern celestial pole corresponds or synchronizes with the stars of Cygnus so that during this time, if you went out at night, you would see the Milky Way spinning around the same spot which you don't see today, almost like this incredible cosmic propeller on the, the nose of, of an invisible, you know, cosmic aircraft just spinning around in the sky. And right in the centre of that propeller, that, the, the nose of the propeller, if you like, are the stars of Cygnus. So they would have represented the most important points in the sky. And this would have been a quite incredible sight because it would also have meant that once every night, the Milky Way aligned perfectly north and south. In other words, if you look towards the north, you would see the Milky Way rising up into the air and eventually splitting in two where the Cygnus constellation was, which was a cosmic bird, and then it would branch, just like the branches of a tree. And there are traditions all the way around the world of this cosmic tree that existed in the north. And I think that this is a memory of the time when the Milky Way rose and set, and I was aligned perfectly to north and south. It's something that doesn't happen today at all. In fact, most of us never really even get to see the Milky Way in our yeah, lives if we live in right. towns and cities. I mean, I've only, I've only ever seen it properly once, and that was, I think, in the Nevada desert, you know, where there was no light pollution, and you saw the Milky Way stretching from, from you know, from, from the one horizon to, to the, the other, you know, right across the sky. And at that point, you get it. You suddenly understand why the Milky Way was so important to these people in the past and why the stars on the Milky Way were, were like stepping stones to reach the sky world. And I believe very strongly that, that the ancients saw that life came from the stars and would return there in death. Like we, we have to stop there. This is such an extraordinary book. Congratulations, Andrew. I really learned so much from it. Thank you. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus & Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington, and I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus.